Hi and welcome to Themico. In this video, we will take a look at how to define the natural frequency of different types of damped systems. We have a very focused and simple objective, yet a concept very important in the study of vibrating systems. At the end of this video, we expect you to know what the natural frequency of a damped system is and what is necessary to know in order to calculate it. Okay, let's start by remembering the concept of equilibrium. Simply said, equilibrium is the comfort position of a moving system, that is, its resting position. If the system is forced out of the equilibrium position, it will try to get back to this comfort position, and in practice, it will oscillate around it. If we had an undamped system, the system would oscillate forever. But why? Well, this would happen because we would not have anything to absorb the vibrational energy. But as we know, this perpetual motion does not exist in real life, from which we can conclude that there must always be some damping in the system absorbing this kinetic energy and transforming it to another form. In the presence of damping, the oscillation will get smaller and smaller, approaching the equilibrium state closer and closer and closer and closer. What dictates this damping rate and the system's damping ratio? To understand where this damped natural frequency comes from, Let's take a look at the equation of motion of our friend, the free undamped spring mass system. The motion of this system can be mathematically described as mx double dot plus kx equals zero, which can also be presented in the standard form x double dot plus omega n squared times x equals zero. If we know the initial conditions of the system, position and velocity, we could solve this equation to get the location and velocity of the mass at any time t. There are two alternative methods to reach the same solution for the equation. Let's focus first on the first solution method. In this one, we write the equation's solution as follows. xt equals c times sine omega n times t plus phi. And then we determine the amplitude and phase shift of the vibrating mass from their corresponding equations which are presented here. Amplitude c equals square root of omega n squared times x0 squared plus x dot 0 divided by omega n. Phase shift phi equals tan inverse omega n times x0 divided by x dot 0. In the second solution method, we write the solution of the equation of motion by using arbitrary constant variables a and b. We can determine these variables by using the following equations. a equals x dot 0 divided by omega n b equals x0. Now you may be wondering why are we using two different methods to get the same solution? Well, it's because of the possibility that the first one may have an error because of the resulting sign of the operation within the square root. That is, the resulting term inside the square root might be negative. So to avoid errors, I recommend we keep working with the second solution method. Note that if we want to also know the velocity or acceleration of the mass, we just need to differentiate the function xt once or twice with respect to time. This is simple, isn't it? Now, let's see how the solution of the equation of motion changes when we introduce damping to the system. To begin with, the equation of motion becomes mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx equals zero. So as you can see, we added the term cx dot into the equation which is a term related to the damping force, and in which c is the damping constant. Now because we have added damping into our system, the earlier equations get a little complicated, which is expected. Let's go through the changes in the first method. The biggest differences are that we need to introduce the damping ratio and also a new term omega d into our solutions equation, and to the equations related to the system's amplitude and phase shift. I know. Now you're thinking, what is this strange new variable omega d? We'll come to that soon. Before that, let's take a look at what kind of changes are applied to the second solution method. As you can see, we introduced the damping ratio and that unfamiliar omega d term also into this method's equations. Keep in mind that just like the undamped case, the first solution could present errors due to possible negative values. Therefore, the second solution method is preferred. Now this is the moment that we have all been waiting for. We are going to reveal the secret identity of the term omega d. It's called damped natural frequency, which shouldn't be confused with the term omega n, which instead represent undamped natural frequency. The system always has a damped natural frequency in case its motion is damped by some amount. 
let's look at their equations to help you differentiate them. The familiar equation for calculating undamped natural frequency looked like this, as you already know, whereas the equation for damped natural frequency is a little bit different. In this equation, we multiply undamped natural frequency with the specific square root term that includes the damping ratio of the studied system, zeta. Because of this square root multiplication, the damped natural frequency is always smaller than the undamped natural frequency. As a conclusion, to know the damped natural frequency of a damped system, we need to first know the undamped natural frequency of the system. After that, we can determine the damped natural frequency by using the information about the system's damping ratio. See how easy it is? You will see in the future that in many cases where we are studying harmonically moving bodies, it will be necessary to also know its damped natural frequency. If you follow the simple procedure shown in this video, you will be able to derive this formula for your specific system. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you soon in our next video.